Hello everyone, can you take great photos with the 70 to 200 mm lens for wildlife photography? Today, I'm going to share with you why the 70 to 200 lens is actually one of my favorite lenses of all for wildlife photography and how you can create some super powerful photos using that lens. By the way, this is Tin Man Lee. I'm a wildlife photographer and I'm a judge for Nature Photographer of the Year, Bird Photographer of the Year and Share the View International Contest. So a lot of us, when we get into wildlife photography, we want to get the longest lens, right? The 600 f4 lens plus a teleconverter and even better with an 800 millimeter lens, right? Because wildlife and birds seems to be always pretty far away, right? That was what I have been doing in the first few years of my wildlife photography. You get that close up shots of these animals in action, right? So a lot of you would think if I don't have a lens like that, is it impossible for me to get good photos? What is interesting is that in the last two years, I've actually been using a 70 to 200 millimeter lens to take this most powerful photos that is called animal small in the frame. So do you know what is my favorite wildlife photo of all time? It is taken by the legendary photographer Thomas Mangelson of a polar bear in the wind sweeping landscape in the Arctic. And in the photo, the polar bear is not like incoming super close up. It's actually very small in the frame, but behind the polar bear, there is an Arctic fox. And that is a panoramic photo. On one side is a like beautiful color of the sun. On the other side is like blue and cold. And that photo won the wildlife photographer of the year. When I saw that photo, I was deeply moved. I have put the link of that photo to Mr. Tom Mangelson's webpage where you can take a look. So over the years, I have always wanted to get a good photo of animals more in frame. Uh, however, it is not as easy as just zoom out and then get the animal smaller in the frame. It's actually much, much more difficult than getting a photo of close-up action uh, with creamy background. The reason why is photographer David Duchemin mentioned in his book. He said, you are responsible for every element within the frame. So what it means is if you see an animal and or whatever subject you are photographing and you think, okay, I want to include more of the environment in the photo. How do I do that? Do you just zoom out? The problem is since you are responsible for every element in the frame and the moment you zoom out, there are a lot of elements that is added to the frame. And if any of this element is not really adding to the story, if any of the element causes distraction, then it becomes a non-photo. So that's why just zooming out when you see an animal doesn't work. And I have been spending a lot of time in the last few years just trying um, to get a photo that really shows the animal in harmony with the habitat. And the reason why this is so difficult, it is uh, because animals, they live in the wilderness and the wilderness is full of tall grass, branches, distraction everywhere. So in order to have a landscape and environment that actually works, it requires a lot of thinking a lot of preparation on how to utilize the light, how to utilize different elements in the frame to really make it work. So the question is, how do you find a habitat that is not too distracting? So I spend a lot of time thinking about it. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to share with you a few photos that I've taken that I'm pretty happy about. And I want to share with you the story and how I created those photos with a 70 to 200 2.8 lens. So one of the best way to have an animal small in frame that works is to have sky as the surrounding, especially after the rainstorm, when the cloud and everything is beautiful in the sky. In order to get a photo like that, you have to think about how to get to a lower angle to shoot up on the animals. For this photo, I was in Tanzania. Uh, I'll put the video of how this photo was taken in the link below. I was with my guy, Dula, for quite a few hours in heavy rain. We were completely drenched for lions. They, they are usually more active after the rain. 
we saw the lion and we were able to get to a position to get lower angle and then i was using a 70 200 millimeter at f7.1 the lion was roaring he was looking for his brothers and also his pride after the rain and with the dramatic sky it conveys the power and the drama of nature i was using a shutter speed of about 800 of a second with because with a wider lens such as a 70 200 you don't really need 2000 of a second or 1600 of a second to freeze the action and i was at iso 800 for that shot so the second photo i just recently took in alaska and the same principle because the habitat of where the bears usually hang out in in the meadow and there are a lot of tall grass and tree logs and it is very difficult to get a photo that is not too distracting however there are a few places in alaska in the summertime where the bears would look for clams when the tide is low so if you time yourself to go to those locations where the bears are coming out from the meadow to this low tide to the mud flat on the beach to look for clams chances are the, there is still a little bit of water on the surface which provide some nice pattern in the foreground. And also, if you're lucky, like this time, we were blessed with some amazing cloud. And one of the best time to go is late August, early September. For this shot, I also positioned myself at a very low angle. I knew that there was a chance that this mother bear would go up a ridge. So when I align that, the background becomes this beautiful sky. And then I just wait for the pose of the bear to be perfect so that all four limbs are separated without any overlap. So that is also one of the things that I always pay attention to. Now, I hope you can see that with an animal small in frame with a dramatic sky background can really convey the sense of space for the animal that are more impactful. If there is no dramatic sky, what do you do, right? So I spent a lot of time to think about it. And then what I realized is in wintertime, in some of the places when there's snow, with deep snow, it covers a lot of these um, distractions on the ground. And if on the snow, then I can create some photo that is not distracting. So for example, right here, I took this photo. Actually, it's not a 7200, but I was using a 100 to 500 millimeter. Canon f7.1 and I was at the 100 millimeter range and we were in a snow coach at the time when we visited this uh, famous spot where the, the lone tree is in, in interior Yellowstone in February. We were just very lucky to encounter a red fox walking on top of the, the hill and we positioned ourselves so that there is a nice composition of the tree on the lower left and the red fox on the upper right, which really shows the scale of the landscape. And I was pretty happy about that. And the same thing can be applied to this puma in the snow. Finally, this is a photo of a puma on the edge of a slope overlooking the foggy sky and the distant mountains. With the current mirrorless cameras, what you can do is use uh, eye tracking to lock on the eye of the animal and then recompose. And basically you just try to zoom in on the animal with the 200 millimeter end and lock the eye and then you just zoom out and look for the perfect composition where you see the distant mountains and those and i just love the effect when the animal is small and then you really can show how these animals overcoming the harsh condition in their habitat and who knows with their disappearing habitat getting a photo of animals in their natural habitat is getting more and more difficult and i hope that with these photos it can bring more awareness so that we can protect this uh, habitat and protect these animals so trying to get a photo of animals more in frame is actually very difficult because 
not only do you have to nail the focus on the eye of the animal and wait for the perfect pose, but at the same time, you also have to keep searching within the frame about the, the pattern, the form, the shape, the leading line, so that the whole composition works. So it becomes super exciting and it's just super fun. So in my photos, I strive to get the animals in natural light. And also, I only want to photograph wild animals in their natural habitat. So I hope you like some of these photos. And if you have any photos of animals more in frames that you like, please share the link in the comments below so that I can uh, take a look at it. And if you like this video, another video of mine where I talk about one of the most important elements in your photo called Fumato and how the greatest grandmaster oil painter such as Leonardo da Vinci used that method in his painting and how we can apply it into wildlife photography. So see you in the next video. Thank you very much.